Let's pray, everybody. You need to come down to the altar, folks. You come if you want to stand or kneel. If you want to jump over a few chairs, you do that. Just be careful of the people around you. I've got my trauma bag out in the car for us older folks. You know, Lord, we sit here and we look around at our church family here. You know, what could make people get up early on their day off? Well, second service, not that early. But what could make people get up on the day off on a nice sunny day, come to an old warehouse, and stand here and smile and sing and jump up and down and kneel down and wave our hands in the air and I guess part of the answer to that, Lord, is something a whole lot better than going out to a grass field with uncomfortable metal chairs and doing the same thing. Nothing wrong with cheering on our family and our friends at sports, Lord. And if there's nothing wrong with that, there's nothing wrong about coming here and just being excited about the joy that comes to Christ. If there's something worth singing about and there's something about being there's something worth being joyful about lord there's something about raising our hands and saying yes this is it about meaning and purpose and about the love of christ about the answers that are in the cross and in the word About coming to a place where it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to be messed up some days and you don't always have to be happy. But come someplace where we are reminded of a firm foundation, of a hope that is in Christ, of a name that means something beyond time and space of a Savior who dies for us, who redeems us, who rose for us, who conquered everything that terrifies us, who stands in the gap for us, who whispers our name in the Father's ear. Who is with us whether we feel like it or not, who represents us before the throne, unifies us, that calls us to love when it doesn't make any sense, allows us to love when it doesn't make any sense, allows us to bear each other's burdens, to lift each other up, to cry when it is time to cry and to rejoice when it is time to rejoice. And that's something we're singing about. That's something worth raising our hands about. That's something worth smiling about. That's something worth being grateful for. Because as that first song talked about this broken generation, there's a lot of folks who would give their right arm to have what we have. But the good news is they don't have to because you gave your life for it. So help us, God, to live lives worthy of the cross. Help us, Lord, to love each other in such a way that when other people from on the outside looking in see that love, they know that there's something different. And help us to live a life that makes you look good, Jesus. And makes people want to know more. Thank you for loving us saving us for taking care of us and let's end this thing right amen death could not hold you the veil tore before you your side
Thank you, and thank you to the praise team. What a wonderful name. We're not here to talk about somebody else's name. We're here to talk about his name today. What a beautiful, wonderful name, that name, the name of Jesus. Thank you for that. I am so honored that you're here today. Uh, everybody is so special, and uh, I'm, I'm, of course, I have friends here today from Tennessee. Now, that's really special. Uh, Martin and Barbara are here, and uh, I love Martin and Barbara, uh, and I'm glad to see you guys. Love you. Thank you for being here. We got some, and my friend Adam is here today, too, and his family. Thank you, buddy. It's great to see you. Um, I'm honored to have you guys here. Thank you. We got something special at the end of our service planned, and, and uh, I'm excited about that. But thank you for being here. You could have chosen to be lots of places doing lots of things, but you chose to be here. And I appreciate that, but that honors the Lord Jesus, and I know it makes him happy. So thank you. Uh, if you if you would take your bulletin, now you need to just keep that with you because uh, everything, a couple of important things coming up this month and then the month after that, and they're all here, so just, just keep that with you. And also, there is a... a an outline there that you can follow me with uh, with the sermon today. So uh, keep that handy, and uh, just just so good to have everybody here today. Um, I'm gonna. I think I think today's message is important. Not that others aren't. I think it is. It's it's a little different in nature. I like to do series, but today just one uh, one Sunday that I'm going to talk about this today, and I'm going to talk about some things that are really important, really necessary, and, and we would perhaps call them uh, essential things. Everything is not essential. We, remember, remember when we went, uh, about a year ago, we started hearing about the pandemic and the virus and, and uh, essential businesses could stay open and essential things. Some things are essential, some are not. Some are nice and handy, and, but optional. I want to talk to you today about some things that are to die for. Now, have you heard that term, to die for? Wonder if you can think of something in your mind that is to die for. Like maybe Miss Peggy's peach cobbler is to die for. Um, I don't know, you know... Um, The brick house fried chicken is to die. I mean, there, there are just some things that maybe you can think of. Now, food things are really wonderful, but they're not really necessarily to die for. But some things in life are that important. And, and I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about some core beliefs 
because I think it's important that we begin to understand what we believe. I mean, have you ever thought about what, what, what if somebody, what do you believe? I mean, what do you believe about church, about religion, about truth? Do you know? You know how to, re I think it's important that, that our children begin to learn what they believe and why they believe it. Not just because grandma or grandpa said it or mom and dad, but because we start to believe that it's real and it's true and it's personal. And I also think it's important that we learn to articulate what we believe. You know, you got it up here, but you also got it in here so that you can articulate what you believe. What, what is truth? Those are the kind. Now, I, I want to I warn you. Well, not warn. I, I want to give you a heads up. Um, today's sermon is, is a little bit, it's maybe not as exciting as some of Elijah's miraculous stories that we, you know, but today I just need you to really focus with me. I need you to focus and dial in with me today because I'm going to talk about some of these things that I believe are essential and, and they're important. But as, as we get ready to dive into this, I want to give you a, a, a process of how to think about today. Because in life, you know, uh, I mean, let's face it, the last year's been a challenge. Our society, there are cultural issues, and there is, there is it, it was the election year. Man, did that get intense. I mean, there are some, there's political unrest in our country. There's social injustices that we're dealing with as a country, as individuals. There's racial tension. And I believe that it's important that we stop and take a minute. Now, we could, we have an option. We could just ignore all that and act like nothing's wrong. We could sweep it under the rug, right? And some people do, or, be, but, but the rug is, is getting kind of high. Or we could just talk about it, which is, would be my preference. I just think we talk about it, and we open God's Word, and we deal with it regarding truth. And so here's, here's the mindset that I want you to, to think about as we think about these things. In, in our position, I believe biblically, here's what I think. Regarding things that are essential, that are non-negotiable, regarding those things, I think we should try to, to work toward unity. There are certain things we need to be unified about. The first service, I had one of our high school seniors, and he sat right here on the front row, and he is uh, an excellent football player, and he's going into the military, a very structured aspect of the military, and he wears number 11. You know why? Because it reminds him of the Twin Towers, and it inspires him, and it motivates him. And I want to tell you, all of our kids aren't going to hell. All of our kids aren't brats. There's a lot of good ones, and so when the team runs out with the flag, he carries the American flag because he loves his country. There's, there's a lot of kids out there like that. And, and that inspires me. But see, we need to know some things as we grow up and, and interact. So regarding things that are essential, we need unity. Our goal is unity. All right, got that? Now, second thing is regarding things that are not essential. Our goal is liberty. You, I told you, you're going to have to think with me today. So things that are essential, unity. We need to be together. We need to know what we believe. Things that are not, listen, I'm, I'm just going to tell you something. A lot of stuff we fuss about and get worked up over are not worth it. It's just not worth it. There's a lot of arguments you enter into that you don't have to win. 
You know what I believe? And, and, and I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm there. I get aggravated. when I, I, I get frustrated. You know, I believe that the devil, our enemy, I think he likes to get us distracted from things that are really important. By getting us to aggravated so we're fussing about something all the time with somebody. Something that don't really matter. So, regarding essentials of life, our goal is unity. Regarding non-essentials, our goal is liberty. Let me tell y'all a secret, and this is going to offend some of you. But I don't really care. You're not always right. You're not always right. Now, I like to feel like I'm right. It makes me feel better. And we think we, but there are certain things in life you better get right. You better get right. That's what I'm going to talk about today. There are some things in life, it, it don't matter. Would you, I know some of y'all are going to scratch your head. Sometimes you need to give somebody some space. Because they don't have to believe just like you. That's kind of America. That's kind of who we are. Now, I want everybody to believe the way I believe because I think it's right. But there are some things that are non-essential. I mean, everybody don't have to eat their pancakes like me. Everybody don't have to. It don't matter how you eat your pancakes. But boy, there are some things that it does matter. So, all right, essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. Give, cut them a little slack because some things aren't worth worrying over. Some things aren't worth fussing over. Getting your blood pressure. And then the last, here's the last thing. In all things, our goal is love. Let me say it again. All right, remember, essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. But in everything, our goal is love. Well, preacher, where'd you get that? Uh, Jesus? Well, I just don't feel like loving him. Well, I guess in that area, you're wrong. Let me read a passage of scripture for you. Colossians chapter 3, before we dive in. Colossians 3, 14. Above all these things, put on love. I mean, all, the, all these, all what things? All these, life. I mean, things that you believe or things you work, you know, the life. A lot of things and, and ways and ideas and people to deal with. Above all of these things that are, that are coming at you, aggravating you, struggling with, above all of them is love. Because that person that, that aggravates you so bad you can't stand it is going to spend eternity somewhere. The Bible says either heaven or hell. Sometimes it's not worth winning the argument. So, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of maturity, of, of, of completeness. I mean, are you mature? Now, now physically, some of us are, are pretty mature. I'm talking about spiritually. Is, is love the most important thing? If it is, then you're mature. You're complete. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. Did y'all hear that? And let the peace that God brings rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And ye be ye thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace to your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Well, preacher, should I get a, Should I do this? What about this? Should, what do you think about this? What do you, let me ask you this question. Can you do it in the name of the Lord? Well, preacher, I'm praying about should I take this job. Can you do it in the name of the Lord? Well, preacher, I'm, I'm praying about uh, going out and getting drunk this weekend, running around on my wife. Can you do that in the name of the Lord? If you can't, then don't do it. That's not that complicated. We make things a lot harder than they have to be. Right? Giving thanks to God and the Father by... One more. One more I want to read you. Romans 12, 18. If you want to look that up, you might want to underline that one or circle it or something. Romans 12, 18. Now, this one convicts me sometimes. If it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably. With who? With, with everybody that... I appreciate you helping me. It is good to have some, somebody that's paying attention and helping me. So, if it, I'm supposed to live peaceably with not just people that believe like me. That's easy. That's easy. That's no problem. It's people that don't believe like me that I'm supposed to live peacefully with. Hmm. All right, here we go. That that is a that is a precursor. That is a. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm going to go into the text now, but we needed to lay that foundation a, as a disclaimer. We we things that are essential we we strive for unity together. Things that are not essential we give people freedom. We give them liberty. Don't have to be like me. Don't have to. Don't have to like what I like. I give you freedom to do that, because God did. Third thing is, but all things we do in love. No options. God don't give you a right to hate somebody. We don't have a right to do that. Boy, do I get aggravated, though, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, my flesh wants to. But God said, no, I sent Jesus to die for that person. All right, today uh, I want to talk about some things that are, I believe, that are really essential. We can look at the essential doctrines of the Christian faith by looking at the core truth of the gospel. Again, now you've got to focus with me. Here's the core. Here's the, here's the gospel. The salvation of humanity through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call that salvation. As God has revealed to us through his holy scriptures is defined as forgiveness of sins and everlasting life with God by confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing that God raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 10, 9. That's what we believe. That's core. That's essential. By examining the gospel message, we can identify the following doctrines that are necessary and essential for salvation to be possible. The essential doctrines of Christianity have to do with, number one, who God is. That is, that is, it's where it all starts, is what you believe about who God is. Number two, who Jesus is, who Jesus Christ is. You know, sometimes you ask somebody, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Oh, good. Then you believe like me. Maybe not. What do you believe about Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? Oh, he was a good teacher. Okay, what else? Oh, he was a wise man. Okay, what else? Oh, he was, well, what they believe about Jesus will tell you where they stand in regards to the essentials of salvation. And thirdly, God's love for his people and his desire to save them. Here are the doctrines. All right, so I'm going to move fast, so just be ready. We're going to go fast because we've got some exciting things to do at the end of the service. Number one, and, and this is foundational. These are, 
somewhat in, in order. And number one, it starts with God's unity. What do I mean by that? Here it is. This is short, simple, very important. There is only one God. Well, duh. No, you understand. Everybody don't believe that. A lot of people believe there's more than one God. Oh, there's lots of gods. There's this God, this God, this God, tall God, short God, fat God, wooden God, brick. No, there's not. Those are idols. There's one God. Well, how do you know that, preacher? 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one. If we're not together on that one, then the rest of it isn't going to line up either because that's the foundation. That's where it all starts. There is only one. By the way, there's also only one way. So got it? That's number one. Number two, God's trinity. Now, the, the, again, some of these are abstract. Some of these are not explainable. That's why faith is involved in believing them. The, the, the trinity of God, what does that mean? While there is only one God, he exists eternally in three persons. One God, but he exists in three persons. Number one, the Father is called God, 2 Thessalonians 1, 2. God the Father. Right? God the Father. Number two, God the Son. His name is Jesus. John 1, 1 through 5. John 10, 30 through 33. John 20, 28. Hebrews 1, 8. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. The Father, the Son, and number three, the Holy Spirit. God exists. He's one God in three persons. Well, how do you explain that, preacher? I'm not sure how to explain that. It just is. There are just things in life. Well, how do you explain gravity? I don't know how to explain how an airplane stays in the air. I can't. I, I see it. I believe it. I get in one. But gravity's real. You want to try that out? Let me. No, I better not do that. I promise you, gravity's real. Just because I can't explain it doesn't mean... There are things you believe that you can't explain. That's where faith comes in. All right, number two, God's Trinity. He is one subs one essence, but three persons. There, there are more than 60 passages in the scriptures that mention the three persons together. Number three, I'm going to go fast. Number three. Human depravity. It's important. Since God is a personal being, he wants personal relationships with us. God wants a relationship with us, human beings. Human depravity means that every human is separated spiritually from God, totally incapable of saving himself. You know why? Because when Adam sinned, he died spiritually, and his relationship with God was severed. There was God, and there was Adam, Adam and Eve. And, and Adam and Eve sinned, and they were separated because of their sin, because God is holy, and he can't be in the presence of sin. So he was separated. That's the depravity of human beings. Additionally, all of Adam's descendants, that's us, We're all dead in trespasses, Ephesians 2, 1. Without a new birth, no one can enter into life, John 3, 3. So because of sin, we're separated from God. Bad news. We, we have sinned and cannot please God by our own good works alone. We can never be good enough to be with God. You can try, but you can never. Romans 3, 10, 11. Number four. All right, number four. These all flow. They all work together. Number four is... The virgin birth. Have you heard of the virgin birth of Jesus? Here, here's why that's important. By the way, these are all essential. 
Jesus was born as a result of a miracle. Jesus was born unlike any other baby that's ever been born on this planet. His birth was different. Mary became pregnant without ever having sex. That doesn't happen. Never happened. It was a miracle. The doctrine of the virgin birth is not primarily about Mary's virginity and miraculous conception. That's not the point. Though this miracle fulfilled a preordained prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, the reason it's essential has to do with God's supernatural intervention. Our sin is not merely something we do. Listen. Our sin is not simply something we do. It is who we are. It's in my, I did not have to teach my kid. Okay, Crystal Scott, y'all sit down. Today, I'm going to teach y'all how to sin. Now, what, pay attention. I'm going to teach y'all how to lie today. Because if I don't teach you, you're not ever going to lie. Right? No. My kids knew how to sin. Because that's what we do. You know why? Because we're sinners. Oh, not that little sweet. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. They going to bite. Oh, they going to pull hair. They going to, oh, man. That's because it's their little nature. That's what separated us from God is because our nature causes us to sin. Our depravity is transmitted to us from our parents. Psalm 51, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 5, because God interrupted the natural birth process. See, if Jesus had a natural human father, then he couldn't save me because he would have inherited sin. And he'd be like us. But he didn't. Who was Jesus' father? God. It wasn't Joseph. It was God. Therefore, that had to happen so that Jesus could save me. Because if Jesus had a regular father, he'd be just like us. Do you see why this is essential? God's supernatural intervention was necessary in order to break the chain of sin. All right. Christ, number five, Christ's sinlessness. Christ was born of a virgin. He did not suffer the effects of a sin nature like us. Throughout his life, Jesus remained sinless. Because of our sin, we could not have a relationship with God. Because Jesus did not sin. He was perfectly able to represent us before God, to stand in our place. The ability of Christ to represent us before God and thus provide salvation for us was because he was born differently and he had not sinned. He never sinned. Number six, Christ's deity. The only way for humans to be restored spiritually to God was for God to... Okay, remember, separation. Here we are. The only way for this to get fixed was for God to build a bridge so that we could get to him and he could get to us. So God, while retaining his full God nature, became a perfect man in Jesus Christ. In order to bridge the chasm, if he is not both God and man, he cannot mediate between God and man, 1 Timothy 2.5. Jesus Christ is, in essence, God. He's divine not just a good teacher or a righteous man. Number seven, Christ humanity. Jesus was also fully human. Jesus got tired. He, he slept. He sweated. He got hungry and thirsty because he was a man. Without being fully man, Jesus could not pay the price for human sin. He needed to be divine to have the power to save us. And he needed to be human in order to adequately represent us. Christ had to be both divine and human. He had to be. Jesus was fully human and fully God. Number eight, the necessity of grace. And we're going to move through these, so stay with me. Because of human depravity, we cannot save ourselves. Well, preacher, I'm just... I'm trying to be good, and, and one day when I die, I hope my good outweighs my bad. 
Good luck with that. Because it ain't going to happen. Because you're not, you can't ever be good enough. You can't. You can't get to God because of your sin. Well, you can't save yourself. It is by God's grace alone that salvation is possible. God is right to call humankind into account for his sin. However, by God's grace, undeserving people will be united in fellowship with him. Without God's grace, no one could come into a relationship with God. Relationship with God is peace, joy, and eternal life itself, John 17, 3. God and God alone is able to rescue us. You can't save yourself. Number nine, the necessity of faith. Faith. Faith is trusting that God can and will save us. There are certain things that you trust in. You trusted in that chair when you sat down in it. They're just, you flip the light switch and you believe the light's going to come on. That's faith. No one can earn their salvation. No amount of good works can ever repay the debt that is owed to God. However, by trusting in him and thankfully accepting his gift of salvation, we can be united with God. Faith, listen, faith is an act, but it is not a work. There's a difference. Faith is an act of my will. I have a free will. I don't have to believe in God. God isn't going to make me believe in Jesus. I don't. That is an act of my will. It's not a work. It's not something I do to gain favor. Number 10. Christ's atoning death. His death was necessary. The penalty for sin is death. If you break a rule, if you break a law, there is a penalty. Because of your sin, there is a penalty. That penalty is death. It's got to be paid. Well, good news. Jesus paid it. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. The penalty we owe to God was paid by Christ through his death on the cross. The acceptable payment had to be perfect. Christ, the perfect man, gave himself in our place so that whoever believes in him will not die, John 3, 16. Number 11, we're almost finished. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ was necessary. Well, I don't believe all that, preacher. Well, then you're, that's an essential. It's, a, it's part of the package. It's part of the deal. The atoning death of Christ paid our, for our sins, but was the, pro, the process was not complete until he had defeated death by being physically resurrected in the same body. John 2, 19 through 21. Because Christ is the victor over death and the prototype of a new glorified physical body, all of humanity will be resurrected and live forever, either in heaven or hell. He was the prototype. It's going to happen to all of us. Number 12. Christ's bodily ascension. His resurrection, now he's ascending. Christ died for our sins and was physically resurrected for our salvation. Forty days later, he was taken up, ascended bodily into heaven. Because Christ has ascended to the Father, the Holy Spirit now guides us and lives. With, I have the Holy Spirit now because Jesus gave me the Holy Spirit because Jesus is with the Father. The Holy Spirit now guides shows us where we are wrong, and comforts us when we hurt. Jesus going to the Father means our life is kept safe in heaven with God. Number 13, this, these last two are going to make you feel better. 13, Christ's intercession. Do you know what Jesus is doing right now? He's praying for you. You, you know what? A lot of times I would not get in trouble because I knew my mama was praying for me. And that, that was, what does it feel to know that Jesus is praying for you? You need to think about that. Christ's bodily ascension allowed him to serve as our mediator. In God's presence, Christ prays continually on my behalf, like a lawyer defending someone before a judge. So Jesus defends us before the bar of God's law and against the accusations of Satan. Christ represents my best interests before God. 
Number 14, this is the last one, and I close with this one. Just as Christ left the world physically, so he will return physically. He was here, he left, and he said, boys, I'll be back. I'm going to leave this with you. You go make disciples, go into all the world, preach, make disciples, but I'm coming back. And we'll do some reckoning when I come back. His second coming is the hope of the world. When he returns, dead believers will receive this resurrected body. Believers that are alive when he returns will not die. You know what? I'm, I'm ready to die because of Jesus. I'm, if, if, if I'm ready to die, because if I die, I believe because of Jesus, what he did for me, I'm going to heaven. But I just, I'd rather not. You know what I'm saying? If Jesus comes back, we might not have to die. Wouldn't that be good? I mean, if we die, it's going to be good. Paul said, to live as Christ, to die is gain. But one day, Jesus is coming back. And if he does, and we're alive, we don't have to die. <laughs> we're going to be caught up. If you're in Christ. Believers that are alive when he returns will not die. We'll be changed, transformed into immortal physical bodies. Christ's bodily return to earth will be visible to all. And believers will rule with him in his kingdom and live with him forever. Those who do not believe these things, the gospel, will be separated from God forever because of that sin. Jesus is coming again. Well, how do you know, preacher? Because he said he was. And Jesus never lied. He can't lie. And he said he's coming back, so I believe he is. Here's the question. Are you ready? That's, that's, that's more important. That's the most important question today. When Jesus comes back, are you ready? Have you understood this process, the message, the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and his ability to take my place? Have you placed your faith in that truth? Because the Bible says that, my friends, is the only way to heaven. Now, there's a lot of groups out there that believe differently than us. I mean, there's, I could talk for hours about different religions. There's Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, Scientology and Christian Science and blah, 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 blah. And you're free to believe whatever you want. The Bible has clearly laid out for us the truth of the gospel. Now you have to respond to that. I, I really would like to welcome you to trust Christ. You, quit trying. Quit trying so hard to be good. Because you, you can't. Trust Christ. Has the truth of the gospel changed your life? It can today. Well, what, what do I do, preacher? You, you, you throw yourself at his mercy. And you say, God, I hear you and I believe you. And I trust you and I accept you. Do what I can't do for myself. And save me and forgive me. And prepare me for eternity. Quit trying to do it yourself because you can't. So I pray that you would trust Christ today. Father, thank you for my friends who are here today. Thank you for these things that are essential. They're important. God, I pray for the hearts of everyone in this building today, in this room. God, that you would draw them to yourself. May they trust you today. In Jesus' name. Has the gospel changed you? Uh, I'm sitting there and I... And there's some of us in here that I believe... 
we've grown up in the church. And we would say, this, this is what I believe. Then how do we walk that out? How do we walk that out? Because, I, because that's part of the challenge. Part of the challenge is, well, first I have to believe it, then, but then after that, I've got to walk this, I've got to walk it out. Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so how do we do that? Those of you, uh, those of you in here that, are, are there anyone in here that went through place this weekend? Okay, awesome, awesome, a couple of them. See, thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that, not just for, your, not just for yourself, not just for your walk and your relationship with the Lord, but for your family, for your spouse. I think the person that's benefited the most, she isn't here to defend it, is, is my wife probably would say. She benefits the most because now I learn, how do I communicate with her? How do I love her? How do I cherish her? Because sometimes we, sometimes we, we, we feel like we know what to believe, but we don't know how to use how God has hardwired us to walk that thing out. We don't know how to, how, how do I use my personality? Why do I act like this? How do I, why do I communicate the way I do? And we want to help you do that. Can we help you take our next step? Maybe place isn't for you. Or maybe place isn't your next step yet. I believe place is for everyone, honestly. But maybe it's not your next step. Maybe your next step is to help your family, to, is to help someone in your family take their next step. And so we get to do that today. And so could y'all, um, Daniel, Catherine, y'all can come on up here right now. We get to, uh, we get to help a family take their next step today. So this is, uh, th these are my friends. This is Daniel and this is Catherine. And this is Abel. Man, I love kids. I've got a three-year-old, four-year-old, and an eight-month-old. I get you. Um, and so this is Abel Glenn Hutchins Nava. And they want to bring, they want to dedicate their child to the Lord. I can't think of a better a better example of a next step than to lead and to steward, to lead and to steward and to help your child and to set yourself up and to say, God, I want to, I want to set my child apart so that he will one day have a thriving relationship with you. And now I, I need y'all to understand here, this isn't, this isn't his salvation. This is, we're asking the Lord to protect him. We're asking the Lord that he would bring people into, into his life and that seeds would be sown. And then at the right time, he would make a mature, he would be able to make a mature decision to accept Jesus as his personal savior. So if you would, would y'all join me in prayer as we pray for Abel and we dedicate him to the Lord. And so Father, come on, hang on. Father, we love you. And I just wanna pray, I just wanna pray right now for this family. And specifically, I want to pray for this young man. I want to pray for Abel. And Father, you and Father, just, we pray that you would place a hedge of protection around him. We pray that you would prepare his heart, that you would prepare his, that you would prepare his steps, that you'd prepare his mind to step forward and to one day have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ as his Savior. Father, we, we, know, we know that you are the one who turns lives around. You are the one who, uh, who is the maker, and you are the one that wants to make a way in and through this young child's life. And so, Father, we're asking that would you do that? Would you protect him? Would you draw him to you? Would you bring people into his life to steward him and protect him and to grow him and to plant seeds that would one day come to fruition? And then would you prepare his father and his mother to be a part of that and to grow him into you, into the man that you've destined him to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. We appreciate that. We love you. This is for you. And, I, and, I, and I, we always love to ask. Yeah, Abel, you can have it, man. Come on. Read that. Read it over, read it over your children. 
That's what it's all about, isn't it, church? We love y'all. We thank y'all. Come up here. If y'all would, we'd love for you to come meet, meet Daniel, meet, meet Catherine, meet Abel and the rest of their family. We love y'all. Have a wonderful, blessed week. You are dismissed. Hang on. You're not dismissing. Wait, I, just I kidding. Add something. I'm interrupting. Just kidding. Austin, can you come here for a second? Usually mom and dad read it. Abel's going to be reading the Bible to mom and dad. He's, he's, I think I already saw he's got that. This is what happens. Uh, I was talking to Austin. How old are you, Austin? Seven. Seven. Austin was talking to his mama and, and said, hey, I, I need to talk to the preacher about getting baptized. Well, why? Well, because I've accepted Jesus. I've trusted the Lord. And, and see, as much as his mama would love to do that for him, she can't do that for him. He has to make that choice himself. And so will Abel. And we've asked God to, to bring him to that place where Abel says, yes, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. And so I got Austin on the baptism list because now he's saved. And he knows Come on. Jesus. So church, Jason, thank you. You're right. This right here is why we give. It's why we serve. It's why we have a building. It's why we have church. Could, could I have the friends and family? Could y'all stand? Catherine and Daniel's friends and family. Thank y'all. God bless y'all. Thank you. Now, thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Thank you.